Welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast uh, with our DSS coach and consultant Stephen Poocher and myself, uh, Joe Coulter. Uh, before we introduce our special uh, guest today, Stevie, uh, just a recent announcement there from the GAA. Uh, they, they've decided to take away the GAA's uh, elite status. Uh, that means that you know they may not be starting until Easter at the least, I think the GAA have said. Uh, that's bad news, isn't it, Stevie? Yeah, it is. It is, Joe. But it's the same for other sports too, you know. And a good friend of mine, Dar Mullen, is the is the manager of Newry City here in, in the town soccer team. And like Newry play in the championship in in the Irish league here, which is one league below uh, the Irish Premiership. Which obviously the Irish Premiership would consist of. I worked with Sean Ward for a year, like and Sean obviously plays in the Irish league as well. But Sean's a teacher. But there was nine of his squad that were full time professionals in that team in Crusaders, for example. And they would be training full time, Joe. You know, and there's a big difference between sort of full time professionals and you know our own association. Like, we're, it's, it's, we've got to remember as well, like that our own association is, is run completely by by amateurs and, and volunteers. You know, from grassroots up. And you know, I suppose for me, like it, it's just seeing the, the likes of Darren there on social media and some of the articles that he's penned about it. And there's frustrations across all sports, Joe. You know, and uh, not just not just yeah. really games. And like it is, it is frustrating and. and I have a, I've worked with a local club, the Brahesford here and down, like, and the players were on to me about Zoom and the likes of that. And you're just sort of saying, look, lads, as long as everybody's doing okay, that's the main thing. And, and you're just trying to sort of keep lads, you know, more from a mental health perspective, like keep their spirits up and maybe fire the odd wee bit of crack in or whatever. And cooking with a cooking competition there recently, so there's a video doing the rounds of me making a pizza, I think, or something like that. Like, <laughs> what I'm led to believe, like, but, uh, no, was there any, any of these wee things that just keep Joe people saying, but look, there's, there's a lot happening in the, in the world right now, and, and I think there's brighter days ahead, and the GA will always be there. And last year it showed in a controlled environment, albeit it was a short season, but it was a fantastic lift for everybody. And if we get the same again this year, Joe, I don't know what public shoes are, but if we get the same again this year, I'd be very happy with that, to be honest. Brilliant, Stevie. Well, as you said there, Stevie, um, Delighted uh, to announce our, our special guest today is Podrick Davis. Uh, Podrick Davis is, is the current uh, Longford men's senior manager. Uh, Podrick also had a great playing career there for, for Longford. Uh, he's got a massive amount of coaching experience with, with clubs and counties at different grades, at different uh, different levels. So it's great to have him on the show here. Great to have you on the show here, Podrick, so that can, we, we can pick your mind. Thanks for coming on. Good evening, lads. Good evening. Okay, um, just about those uh, recent announcements, uh, Podrick. I know that you're with Longford there, and you were probably expecting your your, your team to go back uh, well before Easter. Um, are you disappointed? I'm possibly a little bit disappointed, but while I'm probably not speaking on behalf of the managers' union here, a bit like Stephen, you know, I'm I'm accepting me lot, and um, because I spend the next seven or eight weeks beating myself up and everybody else about. Um, when we should be re- resuming an elite status and everything else, but I'm, I think I'm pretty much along the lines now, in my own mind that I've accepted. Um, you know that the course uh, is going to take and the way it will let them flow. Now it's different for me. I'm at a, a totally different stage in my life, and I'm married with family. I'm 45 years of age. But when we look at some of the players, I, I think it's incredibly difficult. And, and I think what Stephen is there is absolutely uh, spot on. Um, I look at the age profile of our team, and it's from 18 to 32. They're at a completely different stage in their lives as to where we're at. So, well, it should be much easier for us and everything is case on case and, and individual um, based. Um, me and my own mind, um, no, I'm not. I'm not certainly one that's going to rant about the situation we're in. I think we have a tough job as players and mentors and managers, but I, I think those powers to be that has the decisions to make have a far greater challenge ahead of them. Okay, uh, brilliant. Um, just to go back to the uh, beginning of your, your kind of coaching uh, career, Podrick, uh, where did it all begin and, and how did you get here in terms of your coaching career? Yeah, I would have, I suppose, like any other intercompany footballer, I came up through the ranks and played county senior football from around 95 to 2008 and um, never had any great grow. It was all about playing. You know, I didn't want to be selector, manager, coach, mentor. I just wanted to play for as long as I possibly could. And in around 2009, then the, the then under 21 manager asked me to come in as a selector, uh, Mickey Harkins. And that's basically how I got involved. And it certainly became the next best thing uh, to play in. Um, it's not something 
Um, as I say, that, that I, I, I had this great ambition to, to be a coach or, or a manager. Um, and that was it. So on the 21, selected 2009, 2010, I took over our club team. And we happened to, we had a very good team and we won the minor championship. And then I went in with the county minors as forwards coach with, with Kieran Fox. And we won the Leinster title. And that gave me a real buzz for it then. And one, it happened so quickly. Then one year later, Glenn Ryan brought me in 2011 uh, with the seniors as, as a selector and I became the 21 manager that year. So thanks to God, I've done all that when I had an awful lot more energy and youth. Um, you know, so I went in with Glenn from 11 and 12, very much as a selector. But then in 13, I think the whole, the whole coaching thing, um, from where I had come, you know, for, for years playing that, I think it, it became a far greater role within so for individuals within the camp. We're no longer just mentors or, or um, selectors. It was the manager, and then we were beginning to go the coaching role. And whether it was an outsider like we have now, John Donnan or Stephen Coach or whoever it may have been, that was the beginning of me seeing that that's the way that it was going. So for that year 13, um, that was my third year with Len. I would have done a good basis that year, um, even though in the previous two years we'd have, we'd have done, done a good bit of it as well. And that was it then. Glenn uh, stepped aside and I went with him. I took a year out. And even though I had so many years in the end, I come set up as a player. And I had been very, very lucky to get straight in on the 21s, minors, on the 21 manager. I managed the juniors that year. Then I was in with the seniors. So within a few years, I was involved with everybody. And that's his look, look as much as anything else. Took a year out and I said to myself, you know, it might be no harm to get in, just take a shot at the club scene, see all sides of it. And um, I suppose there would always, because you're, I suppose, a former player, mm-hmm. um, there would have been opportunities to manage a club and that. But I've still seen it. If you if you get an opportunity to get into the intercounty scene, you must take it because that may never happen again. You know, the, that door can close very quickly on you and it's over. So I said, I'll take it while it's there. Um, that was it. I took over Mohol and County Leeds from again. Very lucky. Had a good group of players. Uh, we had lots of success in the three years I was there. Back out of it again, year out. And I suppose like anybody else, um, you invest so much time and energy in it when you're there. I I feel like I have to take a year out. I did after I left the Longford scene and I did after I left the Mohol scene. And then 2018 went in as Longford manager. And I'm there since. So that's basically over the course of over a decade now, 12, 13 years, it has is, it is happened almost without me being conscious of it happening. Um, it just flowed from, from, from one area to another. And, you know, you, you, you said there that, um, you know, you, you had a really, really good county career, you know, with, with Longford. Do you think that kind of uh, helps you or prepares you or is, is, do you think it's important uh, to have that before you move into the county setup as a coach or a manager? Or can you do that without having any experience of playing at county level I'm not looking at Stevie there by the way <laughs> I think I think it's a very good question and I think in the past Joe um, it very much helped uh, I won't say helped it almost guaranteed that you would get a decent job and I think you know in many ways thankfully that's been removed out of the game as the best coaches and the best managers not based on how big of a name you are in the past whether it's at a local level regional level or beyond and I think that's hugely important and I think um, being, being a former footballer, a former inter-county footballer, a former great footballer, a former All-Ireland winner it's no longer guaranteeing you um, any of the, uh, the particularly at inter-county level and it's certainly not guaranteeing you, um, you know, the, the big senior clubs and I think that's right. Uh, we've seen so many appointments over the years they are simply not up to it for, for many, many reasons and um, they've just been, you know, Pointed to job after job. So I think the likes of Stephen there will be delighted to hear that. That's my honest belief on it. I think the best coaches and the best people um, are the ones that will, will take us forward and not just because we're a former player. Well, big through that, Stevie. Yeah. It's interesting, Podic, you, you talk about your journey there through the, the minors and the 21s, you know, because you know, you've know done your time, you've got your experience. I found, and as a, this is me speaking as a teacher, I actually found. The transition from seniors two years ago down to minors last year very very difficult. Now I know it was the year and what was in it. We had a season where we had three stoppages due to COVID, so that wasn't easy. But I found it very difficult because I was coming in obviously from a teaching perspective, where I know my students. I'm with them day and night. You know, you're with them nine to three. You, you know their families. You know your background. 
when you were handing a group of youngsters at 15, 16 years of age from different backgrounds who you knew very little about. And I, I find that Podrick age group very challenging. And I'm sure I just picked up on what you'd said is that, you know, you mentioned about energy. You know, it's something that you really, really need a lot of enthusiasm and energy to work with that particular group, you know, that, that particular young group. But did you find did you find that with that particular group of lads at the time that you found the difference between minors? Because we will have a lot of coaches listening, obviously, that, you know, are coaching at different levels of the game. And it would just be interesting to hear that. Like. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible that you should say that. And when you say that, I'm thinking now from, we say, county senior level is seen as the top of the pile. And, and, and that's what it is. And if you rang me in the morning and said you wanted me to do a session with, with another 10 team, I would panic because it's I'm so long out of that scene now. Even to take under 16s and minors, uh, it would almost be panic because the other county senior thing now is just gone to a completely different level in terms of the help you have, uh, the delegation. Um, you know, it's not as hands-on. Maybe some of the coaches hands-on, but they're generally lads that maybe have been there before or they're, they're there for a long time and they've kind of... Um, they went back to being the manager and now they want to go back to a little bit more hands-on. Um, and I, I, I try to get some little bit of a balance in that, but I can see exactly where you're coming from, where you are with the Carlos set up a county senior level and then to go back to, you know, anything really below that, whether it's under 20s, you know, a senior setup, you're really dealing with men. And I mean, from under, you know, certainly from 70s below, you're, you're dealing with boys and it's a completely different setup. And I agree with you for, for many different reasons. Um, it, it's energy sapping. And I would have found exactly, and I would even say now I have no problem going into a group of county senior footballers and talk with them because I think you're in that zone mentally all the time. If you ask me to speak to a group of under 12s or 14s, I would feel that I had to do a lot of prep work of what do these lads actually need to hear from me because you know, you're, you're, you're talking a completely different circle. So I, I totally understand where you're coming from there or where you would have come from Carlo back into a minor setup is completely different. Yeah, it's interesting as well, Joe. We, we, we sort of touched upon it there, part of yourself about a playing career, you know, not necessarily translating straight into a management career. And it, it's, I think soccer is a great, great example. And it was a discussion a few weeks ago. I love Monday Night Football. I think it's the best. I think it's the best football show on TV. I think Carragher and Neville are excellent. You know, there's great analysis, but it's, it's also insightful. You know, it's also really, really interesting in the debates that they, that, they, that they talk about. And one of the things that came up a number of weeks ago, and it's very similar to GEA, we're very parochial in GEA, and we tend to judge a lot of coaches, Podrick, as you would have said, based upon, you know, having an illustrious playing career. And I suppose in my own county as well, it, it's it's more prevalent than ever, you know, if, if you don't have a pocket of, of all our medals, you know, you know it's like, but it's, it's, it's an interesting one because you have Frank Lampard, who, you know, came through Chelsea, obviously as a player, club legend, had one season with Derby County at a level just below the Premiership, and then he propelled into the Premiership job, and you just sort of think to yourself, you can go back years to even you know, take the current managers, the likes of Klopp, who's done his time with names in, in Germany and worked his way up, obviously, but you go back to even Alex Ferguson, you know, who, who is, is a huge inspiration of mine, and read a lot of his books, and I think he's one of the best, for me, he's one of the best sports psychologists there was, even though he wasn't a psychologist. You know, the way he handled players, how he managed players, how he got the best out of players. But he did his time. He did his time. Like, people look at his success with Aberdeen. Aberdeen weren't a big club back then. You know, they certainly weren't a big club. But he also had a stint with St. Byrne before. You know, he, he did his, he made his mistakes. And I suppose I look at my own journey and for coaches out there now that maybe don't have an illustrious playing career. I probably didn't have an illustrious playing career. Well, I know I didn't. I, I, I You know, I, I, I was a moderate player as such. Like, and uh, going back, obviously, to... I had one wee stint, I'll tell you a funny story, actually, I had one wee stint in 2003 with the, you know, the underdogs, Joe, do you remember that? Yeah, I do, I do. I played as well, but as I said, Donaghy one night in a function in the, in the Armagh City Hotel, the underdogs made his career, but it was, so, uh, but it, you know, but it's, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting one, but no, but from, from that point of view, it was, you had to work very hard at your coaching to earn a repetition, Podrick, you know, uh, from a coaching perspective, and, I found myself, I quit at 30, I quit playing at 30, and like yourself, Roderick, we had a bit of success in school around that time, and it gave, us a, gave me a real bug for coaching, you know, and it's, it's, I'm delighted that that point came up tonight, because I think coaches, we have a lot of coaches who, at underage level, haven't really played the game as such, and as I said to them before, 
the good coaches will tell you, you're not there to deliver a pass. You're there to deliver a message, you know. Just on that, Stevie, um, and, and Podrick as well, um, do you think the reason why a lot of successful players maybe um, don't succeed at, at coaching or management level is because what, what worked for them, they might think will work for every, everyone else. And maybe that's one of the reasons why a lot of those you know, successful coaches, as I say, Lampard, I know he's very young at the minute, but, but they think what worked for well will work for others as well. And that's probably why, why they might fail too. Um, just moving on there, Podrick, to um, to coaching philosophy. I know you mentioned earlier on about having a you know a hands-on approach. How would you describe your kind of coaching uh, philosophy? Um, it's, it's a kind of a word that means that I'm comfortable with me. My, my football and philosophy is, um, and I look at any of these young men coming through, and even when they're in a company senior setup, you know, is go back, is there an energy there? Is there, is there a work ethic? Is there a willingness? Is there a desire? Um, have they got that honesty, honesty to be part of that group and the passion for it and the integrity and, and all those words that we've heard thrashed out for, for so, so long and nothing has changed because, because all things have been equal. Um, it's, it's that, you know, the, the, those will be your go-to buzzwords in a dress room, whether it's in, in prior to a game at half time or the end of the game. But, I suppose, from a coaching point of view, Joe, um, certainly I would be a, a big, big pusher of the skills. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, the SNC is hugely important. Nutrition is almost about to take over from, from um, SNC and all these analysis and everything. They're hugely important areas. But the skills of the game for me are where it's at. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, there's only so much time that any of the, any of the coaches get with the group. Do you know, is it is it anything from four to maybe nine or ten hours a week that you're going to get with that group? But I, I think my philosophy very much is is what are to develop the individual. Um, you know, I, I think they're they're responsible for a large part of that themselves. Uh, you know, I, I think as Stephen hit on there, it's about delivering the message, yes, and getting that across. And I believe that in even within a coaching session. It's hugely important what you do physically in terms of drills or what you do tactically or whatever. That's all important. But how do you deliver that message? And, um, you know, and, and the verbals are, are every bit as important. That's what we perceive to be a really good session with drills and blah, blah, blah. So the skills of the game and getting the message across to them. And I think uh, with a lot of players um, across the country, we have failed to get that message across. And you can apply it to something like golf. And I play a bit and I know Stephen does as well. And these pros are hitting tens of thousands of balls a week. Why are they doing it? They're top players as it is. It's repetition, repetition, repetition. And, uh, you know, I see players, we say, have the skill set of Jim Conley and Peter Canavan. Like, like, how many million times did Peter Canavan hit a ball against a gable wall before he was fit in that moment of his weak side when Mulligan offloaded into the hill and passed that ball um, beyond the Kerry goalkeeper in that Ireland final. Like that's that's premiership standard and it's world class standard. And that did not come about by Peter Cannon turning up every night at training. That that came about by Peter Cannon, who for me is the greatest forward I've ever seen, living with a ball day and night. I don't know Peter would have played against him, um, but I know the skill levels that he was at, that he never left the ball out of his hands from when he was a young kid. Stevie, you're, you're a great advocate as well of, of repetition of the skills. I think you, you talked about it on a recent webinar we, we've had. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, listen, I, I, I loved listening to Podrick about that because I remember those Tyrone teams. It's not as if it was long ago. Well, it was 15 years actually now. I think about it, 16 years. But uh, the wife at the time was obviously, you know, a Tyrone fan and we would have went to all those finals, would have went to all those games. Would have seen, I, would have, I would have seen that team in the noughties playing a lot more than down because we wouldn't have played, you know, a, an enormous amount of big games from from 20, from 2000, Joe, obviously to 2010, and we got the other final. So that sort of, that sort of mid-2000s as such was sort of, Ulster football was being driven by our man's role. There was such a healthy rivalry about it, but it's, it's interesting probably because for Peter Canavan, you know, and, and the skill level, uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's phenomenal that when you actually look Correct at the top teams in any sport, they do the basics so well. And you know, you talk about repetition, repetition, repetition. And 
without sounding repetitive, but I go back to Ferguson as well. And, it, and one of the chapters in his book was the first three words of chapter seven or something like that, the, the secret of success in United. Repetition, repetition, repetition. You know, a brother of mine went to watch them training in 2001, I think it was, for three days. Or his, his mate had a job in Vodafone, a tough job in Vodafone, and he got him into Carrington. And he spent three days in Carrington. And he said to me, like, maybe they weren't doing anything spectacular, but they were just, they were just doing the basics so well over and over and over again. Small side of games, tight, tight games, then open up into a bigger game, but it was the basics. And I suppose part of it comes back to this thing about there's a fascination about Dublin right now. And, you know, you know it more than anybody. We've, we've, we've talked about it ourselves. And you're in Leinster where, you know, you're up against it because it's, it's probably a juggernaut at this stage that people think it's better control. But one thing that I don't think about it, they get enough credit for it. And I know there's so many little avenues that they have advantages in. But by God, they do the basics probably better than everybody. And, and I, I fully believe that they do the basics off their right hand, off their left hand, off their left foot, off their right foot. They do it better and they execute it better. And sitting in the kitchen with Daddy today, call up to see him and we're just sitting having a chat over a cup of tea and he's from Dublin and he's from the football. And, you know, and, and obviously he's not been on, he's pulling, pulling the hair to the head, he's not on the watch. But he said to me, he says, like, he says they're the best because they do the basics the best. And, and it was an interesting thing from him. He just, like, just do the basics the best. And, and, and it, that might sound very simplistic, but for me, a large percentage of that. It's interesting for it. You mentioned golf. And I said this before at Coach Education Workshops and like that tennis player will repetitively hit a ball to the wall. You've seen the wee girl who's isolating in Australia that time before the Australian Open. Ball to the wall, ball to the wall. Golfer will do the same. But I wonder how many of our footballers would spend their time doing that. An interesting one, you know? Definitely is. Uh, yes. <laughs> and and just on the uh, on the technical side there, Podrick, um, just in terms of your training sessions and, and that sort of uh, isolated practice or the sort of straight line drills that we talked about, would you do much of that in your training sessions? Would you do much of that kind of th- those basic skills at the beginning of a training session or what, what would it look like? Yeah, no, no question. And um, we would, Joe. Um, our, our training session would very much be made up of the usual get warmed up. Um, SNCs would we'll take that. It's, it's all about getting them, getting them ready to train and, and prevent. Um, injuries, but the first thing that we went to is a skill session. Every single session, uh, if you feel the time isn't there, uh, we have to find the time, we have to squeeze somewhere else. But they must handle the ball, handle the ball, handle the ball all the time, work with their left side, right side, hands, feet, and that's hugely important. We spend a lot of time on that. John Donnan, and as I said, does that for us, um, and, and does it brilliantly for us, and it really drives that. And um, even from our I suppose our time playing, the number of balls at a training session now is absolutely incredible. Five or six, 20 years ago, was quite, a, was quite a few. If you had one or two, you were happy, but if you had five or six, it was brilliant. You had nobody to collect them. That was the problem. Now you have 30 balls at a training session. You go to 40 balls at a training session. So it's, 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 a, it's a ball to every player. So it's all about getting the touches into the hundreds. That's basically where it is. And it's come back to what Stephen was saying there about the ball up the wall or the golf or whatever it may be. Um, and I don't think this is pushed hard enough. I, I would like to have, think I had a very good skill um, level that, and I always say I wasn't a natural. I worked unbelievably hard to be, would say, how, as good as I was. I'm not saying I was anything special, but whatever skill I had, if I, I always feel that came through hard work. I don't believe it was something that I was born with naturally. Um, and it would be 365 days a year I would have handled the ball. And I don't, you know, it goes back to, there's only so much you can do with training, particularly for, for, the, for the younger people listening, because when you get into the 18, 19, 20 and all that, you know, from a technical point of view, the development is years over. You know, you're polishing and you're perfecting and you're trying to get all the little bits and pieces done. But how you kick that ball, the action you have on both sides, you know, striking half your right hand, your left hand, that's we can see that a long way and all you have to do is go back and look at the videos of some of these kids were 12 it hasn't really changed by the time they're 20 so particularly for the underage kids and that if you're trying to, to develop the left side at the same pace as the right side that has to be done from the first time to handle the ball and i think it's we're getting it harder and harder to get that message across because of snc's nutritionists and and like Yes, science is hugely important, but the skills of the game is a science in itself, and I think we're losing that. 
Stevie, would you agree with that? Where too much emphasis on the physical side of things, especially at a young age? Do I? I obviously have a, have a piece that I do in the Gaelic Life every week, and the last decade or whatever, and, and coaching. And you know, I've many's a week, uh, many's a week, I've had uh, an article on how important it is to refine our skill and not lose sight of the most important things. And I remember going back to Barney McAleen, and I don't know, Portic, if you know Barney from, from down, but Barney, hugely successful, you know, schools coach and highly respected uh, 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 coach here in, in, in the county and would have spent a bit of time with, with Adrian McGuckin at Jordanstown uh, during, during the Sigerson campaigns. And I remember him telling me, and it's very, very interesting and iconic that you mentioned that, product because he was saying to me, like, you had some of the best footballers from Derry, Tyrone, Donegal, you know, Antrim, Down, Armagh, all congregating to Jordanstown. And he says, physically, never seen anything like them. You know, shape of their lives. They had, he said, you know, the muscles, the wee vein in the arm and all, the vein was bursting out and all, you know, and tight tops. And he <laughs> said, but if you ask some of them, they kick past the ball 30 yards accurately with their right and left foot. A lot of them couldn't do it. A lot of them actually couldn't do it. And but it's interesting you talked about that window. 90% of skill is acquired between the ages of 12, sorry, 8 and 12. 90% of your tactical ability is acquired between those ages. That's the sponge age. And it's probably a more scientific term for it. But if you don't get them then, it's nearly too late. To go back to Martin Clark's uh, chat to me about his time in Australia. And I, I love talking to Marty and picking his brains about it because it, it, it's an intriguing time that, that he was there. And I was lucky enough to be his club manager. So you could, you could pick his brains in various aspects of professional life. When he went to Australia the first time, they took him away from everything for six or seven weeks and they literally worked on his skill acquisition for those six or seven weeks before he even went into a game for it, before he went in, even into a game situation and training. Skill, skill, skill. He was told to carry a ball everywhere with him. He said he was walking down the main street in Collymouth for a coffee. He was bouncing the ball on the wall, he was bouncing the ball on the ground, you know, just took the ball every single place he went. Because the senior pros in the club would be waiting for their lunch at lunchtime and passing the ball off the wall to themselves, you know, and we can learn a lot from that. You know, we can we can take a lot from that. And I just feel that, uh, that, that sometimes we can get lost in the little gimmicky things and not really focus in on what is so important. And that's, I've been a big advocate over the last few years with clubs about a wall and a ball. Done a few sessions with the Harps up the road and Rex, a, a, a club that was, that was very close to, to my former school in Scotland. They built a beautiful... Uh, wall ball facility actually at their club in memory of a young fella who had passed away, a young Colin Baldwin who tragically passed away at a very young age. And they designated this wall to him and they put this like sort of a special gravelly type sand in it that the, the commodes could use, the footballers could use. And you could do a savage warm up there man for 15 minutes with the wall and the ball and your your skill works done. And you go onto the field and do your your games then, you know. But I I I, I definitely agree with Father so I think that there's Sometimes we can lose sight of the, the fundamental, basic skill levels in some of our players at the present moment. In time is probably not at the levels it should be at, and 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 that's something that I said last night to a couple of lads in the club. I met a couple of senior leaders. I said, "Boys, I'm not concerned about five Ks because these five Ks are coming out their fucking ears. I'm more concerned that some of our players might have lifted a ball in six months. That's what I'm more concerned about, you know. So it is an interesting one." Yeah, um, ju and just on the on the lockdown there, Podrick, do you, obviously you have the Longford lads doing a, you know physical training. I think I've seen Mickey Quinn putting a few tweets up there of him doing hill runs and all that type of stuff. Um, no. would you Would you... No, yeah. Long, not Longford are training behind those doors. Well, no, it's back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking you to comment on that, Podrick. <laughs> Only joking, by the way. I don't... <laughs> no, we'll Cut that out. Um, <laughs> The crime has been caught, as you well know, up there. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, um, would you would you be pushing the lads, obviously, to do a lot of the technical stuff um, during the lockdown? I know it's difficult to recreate the game game based stuff, but you, you would push the technical stuff during the lockdown too. Yeah, I think our last game it was the last point I met against Leash. Uh, we were obviously beaten that day, and you're beaten by the margins again, a couple of points. You know, I was just the point that I was making to them that you know the amount of hours it needs to win to you know you know particularly kicking kicking up the ball or the hands of of um, you know we, we generate higher trade in Division Three and Division Three and Four teams. A lot of the skills are very good, but the kicking um, you know can always get better, and you're always looking for that improvement all the time. And yeah, we're pushing them all the time to handle more ball. I think um, 
on resumption, the last time, to be fair to them, they came back in very, very good nick, and a lot of credit has to go to all the SNCs throughout the country. But uh, I suppose there's a lot of club football played too. So, uh, you know, the clubs des- deserve a lot of credit for the way all the intercounty teams came back. And in many ways, you wouldn't even have known there was a lockdown. You know, there was no real fall off in any of the teams. Okay, some teams done better than others, others and some, some teams would be very disappointed with how the year panned out. You're always going to have that in, in, in a pandemic, any you see with Liverpool at the moment. So um, you are, you're looking for that all the time. Um, I suppose look at some lads, that's the nature of the beast. Some lads just need a little bit more encouragement than others. Some lads don't have the motivation of others, and that's understandable. And it's, I suppose, just keeping on top of them. Lockdown was difficult, it's incredibly difficult. And for all the experience, we all have uh, enormous of experience, anything like this before. Um, so I do think the way that it came back, every team in the country hurt on football was extraordinary. Now, I know they had the advantage of getting back and playing club football in Harlem, but God, it was incredible the way they came back. When, when, you, when you consider the way where the game was at 30 years ago, you know, even the way we trained, we, 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 we ran slow, slow to play fast, and now it's all about explosion and speed. And they're, they're just a completely, they really are a different beast, you know, and they're, they're, um, I suppose all their condition and their training is, is, is all their own speed, really. Okay, absolutely. Okay, thanks thanks for your comments there, lads. Um, just going back to your kind of uh, your, your coaching philosophy there, Podrick, I know that um, obviously you're managing now and, you know, you've done a lot of coaching. Would you take the sessions now? Would you lead the sessions now for Longford or would you take a step back? And, and if so, is it more difficult to take a step back and let others go in and do the coaching? I think... Um, in the early days of my coaching, um, I think my biggest problem was I couldn't delegate. Um, in my own mind, if I didn't do it, it wasn't done right. And that just doesn't fit. Not particularly at intercounty senior level. You know, the, the more messages, the more voices, the more variation that you can get, the better. And we are lucky enough to have, there's no point in having all this backroom staff, which you do have now at intercounty um all levels really, um, minors and under twenties and everything. And if you have all that help, you have to tap into it. And I think if I had a failure in the in, in the past, and it was one of my shortcomings, is that I didn't delegate, and I used to end up with selectors and coaches standing looking at me. So I think I've changed very much. Um, I think it's for the better, not for the better for me, but it's for the better at the group that I'm training. And I, I think they need access to everybody. I'm very very lucky. If there's one thing I've got right, it's it's the backroom team that I've got. I'm incredibly lucky to have the two selectors I had in in, in Don Leonard and Paul Barden, SNC coaches Jimmy Murray and and, and Alan Malone. And, you know, just a great. And I mentioned John Donnell near, earlier. To have all those, and for me not to say I want to lead the session and not use them, I just think I would be depriving the panel of players of that, and I'm certainly not prepared to do that. So, yeah. Course sessions will will vary. John John is very much a skills coach, and the lads you know prepare the team and condition the team. And then I think when it when it comes to you know, the, the, I suppose how we set up and how we are tactically and everything else, and um, what team we're likely to pick in that, you know, I think those that's the brilliant relationship with us in in that, you know, the standoff and is very much less at the core management when it comes to where the team should be at and how they should play, etc. Stevie, you've uh, Stevie, you've got dual roles. You you, you coach and you manage. Um, is it kind of difficult to move between the two roles of you know coaching and management? I know they're for different teams, but a, a delegation there, as Podrick said, it's very important for a manager. Yeah, it is. It is, Joe. I suppose my only experience. I haven't been at Podrick and experienced managing at, at county level, but I've experienced managing at club level, at senior club level, and even senior club level now has got very, very serious, Joe. Um, clubs are demanding a lot more. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say clubs, but players are probably demanding a lot more. You know, the, the expectation levels now of clubs and everyone in down looks at Kulku, for example, and what they're doing and, you know, what are they doing? And, and as their backroom team gets bigger, everyone thinks that their club backroom team should get bigger as well, you know, and, and sometimes less is more. I probably would probably agree with me there. Sometimes you can have too many around you and you can have too many voices and, and what is the old saying? Too many took spoil the broth. But look, I've made mistakes, Joe. I've, I've managed, well, I've, I've managed and raked, I've managed Billy Holden and, and I've managed in So I've managed three senior clubs. Uh, very fortunate, you know, for 10 years now. Uh, three within Rake, six with six with the Harps and, and one with Brantford, all in Division 1 and down. And, and it, it, 
I've made mistakes from a selector's point of view. I've had too many, you know, and then I've had, I've had times where I've had not enough, you know, and I think we've got, we've got a good balance now uh, with the club. We've got good people around us and, you know, different, different areas of expertise, former players of the club. And the difference at club level, I suppose, and, and Podic would probably agree with me here, is at inter-county level, it's, it's probably easier to get good people uh, who are willing to give up their time because it's, it's probably seen as more prestigious and, you know, it's, it's more professional and, you know, it's, it's probably more rewarding as such as well. Whereas at club level, you're giving up a lot of time and you're asking people to give up a lot of time. And I'm very, probably very fortunate, Joe, that I've always had good people with me. I've always had good people with me. And, uh, you know, even one of your own club men there, Francie Colin, like I've worked with Francie with Mayo Bridge as a coach. And, and then he he reversed the roles. Like he was manager at Mayo Bridge and I was coach the year we were beating those two finals. And then we reversed the role and he became in with me as a selector with Valley Hole and I was the manager. And I think I remember reading a couple of books about about this. I don't know what Podrick's view is on it, Podrick, but, you know, you nearly have the three hats anyway, Joe. You nearly have the the coach, the manager, selector hat on you when you are managing, you know, you're thinking about it all the time and you're, you know, you, you're, you're obviously getting into training now and again. And, but as a coach, you know, it's it's completely different. You know, it, it's even your relationships with the players maybe slightly different as well. You know, now, I'm a players man anyway. I like to build relationships with players. I like to get to know the players personally, you know, because I think that when you invest some time in them and you get to know them a little bit outside of football, uh, and it's probably easier for Paul because he knows probably a lot of them because it's his own county. And, but if you're going into another county or you're going into another club, you know, you have to build relationships. And I remember the great John Morrison saying one day, and it was, it was, it was something that I always took with me. John was a huge inspiration. I, and I started going to coach education events in around about 2007, 2008, and John was, was one of the first I went to. And I remember him saying to me one day, he said, Stevie, players won't care what you know until they know that you care. You know, and I always took that sort of mantra with me that, you know, if, if you show that you care, you know, and you're there in, in, a, in, a, in a mentor role, but Patrick, you, you'll probably agree with me here when I say this to you. Life has changed in general. You know, gone are the days where, you know, you, 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 you were told to tighten yourself up and get on with it. You know, now it needs to go to be, we're dealing, Joe, with so many different personalities, so many different, so many different things going on in life. And social media is so toxic for young people now as well because it becomes so impressionable. Like Patrick talked about the condition of the players now. Players nearly be shamed. It's nearly body shaming now. If you're not in good condition in the inter county change room, seriously, like you know, it's nearly but you said, you know, the ship he's in compared to me, whatever. And it's it's got it's got very much like that. So there's an awful lot going on in in, in people's lives now. And I, and I think as a coach or a manager or whatever role you're in, you know, you you have to wear so many different hats, Joe. You have to wear so many different hats, and you have to become very. You have to show a lot of empathy as well. You, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a good story. Like there's a good friend of mine actually he works in a, in a, in a company. And uh, I'll not name him or name the company or anything, but he was going through a difficult time. And uh, he, he sort of leaned on one of his friends who would have played for Down in the early 90s and leaned on him for a little bit of advice, you know. And he says, look, I'm thinking about taking a, a bit of time away from work. And it was around Christmas time. And uh, this, this individual says, look, I'll ring you tonight. He says, no problem. So away he went anyway. And man X went away and, and was waiting on his phone call. And that night the phone rang and he, he says, look, I know you're struggling. He says, but you know what you do? He says, you tighten yourself up. He says, you go a set of balls, you get back here on Monday. <laughs> you know, and it was like one of those old school ones. You just should, and that doesn't work for it, as you know, anymore. You know, it's just, you, you have to be so, you have to be so empathetic now and you have to be so careful in, in the way you handle people. It's, it's, yeah, look, yeah. It goes back to the, the question that Joe asked earlier on. Why do some former uh, footballers not transition? Um, because in a lot of cases they're just not prepared to change themselves and the way they think and we're all a little bit like that old school we always want to go back to the past but I think the way forward is the way forward and you have to you, you've got to change with the times the world is a completely different place than it was five years ago um, so we, we, we got to move with the times and I, and I think you know we, we see it going back to the Premier League and we, we see guys that you would think they were just perfectly made um, for management and it doesn't work out. And I think for, for, for them very reasons. Brilliant, lads. Um, and just we we're talking about uh, Longford there, just to, to think about the success of Tipperary and Calvin there in the championship, um, obviously last year, Podrick. Kind of, uh, would that kind of be your ultimate target for Longford to break through, especially in the championship? 
or, or obviously Division Two status? There's no question. It always is. Um, and since that has happened, like Tiberi and Cavan have went and they've bridged a 100-year combined gap between them, which is extraordinary, really. And um, Before Christmas there, I had coffee with Mickey Quinn. And during the conversation, I just said to him, I'm no longer um, analysing the Dublin setup or comparing ourselves to them or where we can improve and look at Dublin. Because the reference in the back reference always seems to be Dublin, Dublin, Dublin. I find myself doing it. I'd say Stephen finds himself doing it all the time too. And I'm going to consciously try and get myself away from that. And the first model I'm going to look at is how how the Tipperary and Cavan cross the line. And I think any teams, you know, like ourselves, that that you have to look at that. And yes, there were moments in time, and it's highly unlikely that th- those two teams will be the, the, the provincial champions next year in both their provinces. But they found a way and they've done it. And I think for the likes of us, that's what we now have to find. So while the Kilkenny model is fantastic and the Dublin model is even greater, and you know we have to find out how did Clear do it in '92, how did Leitrim do it in '94, Westmead in 2004, Offaly came in '97, Cavan in '97. How did these teams find a way of doing it, um, and why have we not done it? And I think that that sort of stuff would always eat away at me. And you know, extraordinary achievement. Um, there's no question about that. Uh, we'd have to presume that both, both Cork and Kerry are better teams than Tipperary. And if you, you guys know Ulster football an awful lot better than I do, and can we say with absolute certainty that Cavan are in the top four counties in Ulster? We can't say with absolute certainty. So it is an extraordinary achievement. And Mickey Graham, who I would know, obviously, um, it was a big, big achievement what he done with Molignata. But I think I think that that Cavan achievement really is extraordinary. Do you think the um, do you think the straight knockout uh, system last year helped them out? And the, I think we've got the backdoor system coming up, and that you might not get as many teams on the lower levels coming through the backdoor system. Uh, that can be to Paul Regar, Stevie. Yeah, well, Joe. It's like anything, it's knockout football um, on the day. You know. I go back to a couple of years ago when when uh, when, when Carlo beat Kildare in 2018. You know, Carlo were out of the championship when Kildare were beating Mayo. You know what I mean? You know, a couple of weeks later. So, it, it, it like for such a great day it was, it would have carried more value if it had have actually knocked them out of the championship, Joe. You know, that type of way. And I think Podrick's probably had a few. I'm not sure, Podrick, if you have been, I think you were there actually when, when Longford beat Monaghan. You speak Monaghan in the, in the back. You were, you were the manager then in the back. No, no. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. No, but I, I've always, actually, that's one thing I was going to say. Longford have always been, you know, a side who I always admired, you know, through the back door, particularly because of some of the scalps that they would have taken and, you know, the football that they would have played as well. And I know Podrick during my time and Carter would have come across each other quite a bit, you know, with challenge games and the likes of that and league games and stuff. And Paul was a, some brilliant, Longford have some brilliant footballers, some absolutely brilliant footballers. You mentioned Mickey Quinn. It'd be great to see Mickey back playing, but like some fantastic footballers and, my knowledge of Leinster football obviously grew quite a bit in the last number of years. And it's amazing, Joe, the amount of really good footballers there is in other counties that are completely overlooked because of the obsession with, you know, the best team. And in every sport, you have best teams. Like, I was looking at a couple of statistics last week in rugby and soccer. And over the last 20 years, like, I think, I think in the last 20 years, correct me if I'm wrong, I think between Manchester City and Manchester United, the Premiership has been in Manchester like 15 or 16 of those years out of the last 20. You know, something something along those lines. You know, I think Liverpool won it once, Leicester won it once, Chelsea <coughs> won it twice. You know, and, and you're sort of thinking to yourself, in every sport, you're going to get dominant teams. So in our in our sport, Gaelic, you have Kerry and you have Dublin who have accumulated the guts of 79 or 80 All Ireland titles between them. You know, so they're always going to be there. You know, they're always going to be challenging for those titles. But this is the thing that I've always said as well, and it's the same here and down. We have the back door. Kilku were caught this year by one point uh, in a phenomenal game in Nuri. I was at the game. I was lucky enough to get in as, as a spectator. And I just went out of that game that night, and I actually said that night, Kilku will be the team to beat in the championship. And everybody looked at me, and I said, because you'll beat them once, you'll catch them once, but you'll never catch them twice. And I suppose the same applies at inter-county level. You might catch a big gun once, Joe, 
but you'll never catch them twice. And what Podrick said about Cavan is true. I think from a nutritional point of view, Ulster football is it's phenomenal. Like in the last 11 years, every single uh, county in Ulster has contested a provincial final. In the last 11 years, nine Ulster counties have all been in a provincial final. Now, for me, that speaks volumes of the competitiveness of the, of, of the province. They might not have won it, I agree, but they've all, every county has sampled a, an Ulster final. You can't say the same for Connacht or Leinster or, or Munster. And what Podrick said is correct. In Ulster, it's so attritional, Joe. And for Cavan to come through the preliminary round in a knockout situation, you know, where you're not getting a second chance to come to win it is, 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 is top class. It's absolutely top class and, and hats off them. But they're playing their football next year in Division 3. And as Podrick knows himself, Division 3 is a very, very difficult league to get out of. I know from speaking to the lads in Armagh as well during their time, their first season with McGinney in 3, they got off the terrible start and didn't get out of 3. And they had to get out of three the following year. It was a massive focus on them. Just thought I'd love to ask you a question, you know, because I definitely fully believe that Longford are, are without shadow of a doubt, well capable of holding their own division two. That, that's that's where I would see you. And, 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 would you share that, that opinion? I suppose it's difficult for you to maybe answer that, but. Well, I certainly would feel it would appear as we have, and that's always the belief, right? And I believe this group of players, and obviously that's that's one of one of the targets. Um, that said, in in the last decade, we've been in Division Two once, so it's it's results based. We can say where we feel we should be. We can say where we feel we're good enough to be. But just go and do it. This takes me back to the Tipperary and Cavan thing again. Like it's all very well and it's notional to say that we can be here or here. But look at it. it's 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 played over a number of games. Get yourself in there. Um and you know that's very much our mantra. Uh yes, we believe we're good enough to be there, but we must go and do it. Uh, and I think that division uh, three, that's why it's hugely important for the likes of ourselves. You know, it's a it's a real um I suppose a real indication of where you're at. Uh, if you could just push yourself out of that division and get into division two. But as you say, we have a group of players that are good enough, number one, know they're good enough, uh, number two, and we have a, a management and, and a support base that believe they're good enough to get there, but we must go and do it, no excuses. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, think that's, yeah. I think the leagues, I think the leagues, Joe, for me, are the, the, the competition that I think, you know, needs to be, I don't know if put excuse this, but I think the leagues definitely need to be, you know, prioritised moving forward and, you know, the championship's the championship and it, always be there and the intrigues around it will always be there and everyone but for a large large percentage of the counties it's it's the league you know and it's the buzz of playing in big games in Division 1 or it's the, it's the buzz of a team getting out of four for the first time or three for a long time and you know the, because those, those leagues are so competitive and every team will go in every team from Division 2 down will believe they're going to get promoted at the opening day of the season you know and, and every team in Division 1 will want to retain the status, you know, and that's, that's what makes the league, I think, so competitive, eh, Patrick, you know, and I think that it's something, we were speaking to Clark about this, and he said to me, like, he, he looked at the Australian model, the Aussie rules, where you play 16 consecutive weeks in a row, and then you have your, your playoffs and things like that at the end of the season. It's like, you get to see the best players every week. It's the same in the Premiership, the same in the rugby. You know, we might wait, we might wait in the old system, championship football, we might wait to see a player in his, playing in peak summer, one of your favourite players playing in May, then you mightn't see him again for too high or end of June. You know what? It, it's 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 a system that maybe needs maybe needs a wee bit of of, of revamping for me anyway. Yeah, well, we we wait to hear you know the championship structures because of because of the uh, recent delay. So we so we'll see whether or not you know there's going to be a, a backdoor system coming up or not. Um, just to kind of uh, finish off, lads, the last last few minutes. Uh, Podrick, I was reading um, an interview you done there in 1998. I don't know if you remember it now, um, but you actually done it with Hogan Joe, Stand. Yo, I hope you don't pull any skeletons from my closet, boy. <laughs> There's a lot, Stevie. There's a lot. Um, Podrick, um, they asked you about changes that you wanted to see. You know, we were talking about changes in the GA. They asked you what changes you wanted to see in the GA. Obviously, you've done this when you were a player. Uh, you gave two. The first one was... Um, you wanted two referees, but the second one was that you wanted them to clear up the tackle room because it's um, it's a difficult one to define. Do what is the tackle? Do you how do you teach it? How do you coach it? Because it's a difficult one. 
<laughs> I have no idea after all these years. <laughs> um, I think I have a little bit of an idea, but certainly we haven't. We don't have a defined tact in the game. I don't know whether Stephen agrees with that or not, but we don't. Um, very much when we're coaching it, um, I feel that you're 80% tacking with your feet. Uh, you know, if you fly in or you fly out, it's over. And it's a bit, it's a bit like the god swing. If you're rescuing with your hands, it's over. And um, look, at, I don't know how. I think, look, to be fair to everybody involved, room makers and everything else, I think we would long have a defined tack if it was possible. Um, rugby has it. Ozzy Roots has it, as, as Stephen um, touched on earlier on. But uh, we don't have it um, since 1998. God, I don't know where you found that interview. But anyway, um, we certainly don't have it. But just in relation to the tackle, I, I do. I certainly feel that and players um, would be just sick of listening to me talking about missed tackles. And missed tackles is where you miss them with the feet. You know, where, where you get you get into a close, you don't get in close enough. Are you lunging? You know, and it's a dishonest, it's a dishonest tackle. You're just taking yourself out of the play. Um, you know, so there's, yeah, the boys would hear me talk it's, about this about tackle. This is how, Stevie, this is how they define a tackle. Well, well they tried to define it in the Rule J rule book. They say a tackle is aimed at the ball, not the player. A tackler may use his body to confront the opponent, but deliberate bodily contact, punching, slapping, arm holding, pushing, pulling, tripping, jersey pulling, or full frontal charge is forbidden. Now, I don't know if that's you know yeah. we see a lot of tackles and they're not you know they're not given and boys are pulling they're punch they're slapping and they're still not blowing up. What are your yeah. thoughts? I'm just I'm just reading it here actually I have it in front of me actually the the, the definition in the in the GA of a tackle but as Podic said there it, it, that's not really a definition Joe you know it's more mm. of a it's, it's like you couldn't it's a guideline if you had a solicitor for example who looked at that you know and you know, who was of an argumentative uh, uh, sort of background point of view. Like, he could obviously pick holes in that and you could be, it could be very subjective in a number of, in a number of ways, you know, but I agree with Podic as well. I think as well, one of the things about it is, and, and I think, I think we'd love to see games that flow. I don't know what Podic's view is in this, but I take a referee in our own county, Paul Flume. Like, Paul's operating at the county level now and, and I, I, I love to see him refereeing club games here because he lets the game go, Joe, and it, I don't mean let go in a, in a silly way. He just lets it flow and doesn't blow tedious stuff and, and doesn't blow tedious fouls. And I think that's why people tend to sway Porrick towards Hurling quite a bit because of the sort of the nature of the game that it's let flow a lot more. And and, and they, like in Hurling as well, there's a lot of outcries at the minute over whether they should bring in a black card to, to punish cynical fouling. And, you know, they have issues in their own uh, game as well. Over the definition, I, I I don't know what a tackle is in hurling to be honest with you, but sometimes it's just a, sort of cringing watching it. But the uh, but it, it, it is for me. I think if, if the games were maybe just let, let go a little bit more, you know, and and those sort of three quarter type fouls were maybe were maybe let off and play advantage a little bit more and things. I think become a better spectacle. But it is very difficult to coach a tackle, and this is the biggest challenge probably for coaches, and and it's something that I would have would have would have known in the past as well. You like to see a bit of intensity at training and you like to see boys turn into each other, but that's okay doing that. But if you're doing that every night at training and not punishing a foul in training or letting lads look just get up and get on with a type thing, like, and you know, you you think back to your school days, Joe, and the Abbey there, and the great Val came, you know, Val wouldn't have blown a foul if, if you'd have been getting ridden by three men on your back, like it wouldn't have been a foul, you know. And, you sort of you sort of think to yourself now, like it wouldn't have done you any good from a from a from a technical point of view uh, tackling. But no, I, I think it's a it's a it's a it's an area of, of huge debate and huge scope, and it's just an area that you can just probably try your best as a coach to to harness in your sessions as well as you can. You know. Yeah, it's a difficult it's a it's a difficult one. Um, in, in at the end of that um interview, Podrick, um, you also said. Uh, I'd like to play club championship until at least the age of 60. <laughs> you still playing? <laughs> no, 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 no. Definitely, definitely um, I knew when to get out. Once I lost a half a yard, I was out the door. <laughs> I was too small and not strong enough, so when the base, when the base was gone, it's good luck. 
<laughs> very good, very good. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, lads, uh, thanks very much uh, for coming on the show. Thanks very much to our special guest, uh, Podrick there. And uh, Stevie, thanks very much for, for coming on. I think, Stevie, you're messing about with the with the tactical pad there. You've got you've got a subscription to it. Have you any, have you any good drills going on? It's a... Uh... It's a good, it's a good wee app, you know. I have a friend actually in Donegal does it quite a bit of it, messes about with it and things like that, and does draws up drills. And it's, it's an interesting wee app, Joe. You know, I don't know, Patrick, have you used any of those little apps? Like, but they're they're, they're good for drawing up like yeah. drills and things like that, you know. Yeah, it's nearly gone to a level now. God bless you, but you'd want to be doing classes in it. And um, what's available now, the, the stuff is unbelievable. And um, yeah, in terms um, of equipment and apps for analyzing and that. It's, it goes back to what we talked about. It's moving at such a fast pace and you have to try and move it as best you can or you just let be left behind. You wonder what you're looking at in the end. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And it can only it can only help coaches, Joe, you know, uh, you know, moving forward, you know, as, as Podrick said, the material out there. And I, I love listening to things like this, like podcasts. Not, I don't like listening to the ones I've done myself, but I like listening to, to what other coaches podcast. There's, there's a world of stuff out there. And I think what, what one of the things that lockdown has done and, it's fantastic that Podrick on tonight as an intercounty manager because there is only 31 intercounty managers in Ireland, uh, or 32, uh, uh, so to say, if you can't, don't play football, but there's 31 intercounty managers in Ireland. To hear an insight and a view from that as well, and I think what lockdown has done for me is there's a lot more of this sort of, you know, cover homework type policy in the GA, but we've seen a lot more people come out in the last year or so and, and, and give up their time freely and things like that to podcasts and Zooms and I watched one there recently with Stephen Rochford, uh, live GA, and it was brilliant even just to get his insights, you know, into what they were doing in Mayo and what they were doing in Donegal. And I think there was another one there with Colin Nally, current meat coach and things like that. It's brilliant to see these because that's, that's how we learn. You know, we learn and grow off each other, and that's that's the beauty of it. You know? Coaching is content, and you have to share it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Now, now it's all about implementing it, lads, when the lockdown ends. Okay, well, thanks very much, there, lads, and uh, thanks very, very much for everyone for tuning in. See you soon. Bye. Thanks, lads.